this St. Patrick's Day. In case y'all didn't know that was today, or thought it was yesterday. Um, there's a lot, of course, in the bulletin, and I'm going to go through, I'll mention just a couple because uh, things has got to be done. Um, Easter lily order forms need to get in, of course. Believe it or not, we're just a couple of weeks away from Easter. Uh, next week is Palm Sunday. It doesn't seem like it should be here already, but it is. And so um, that means that uh, we have an egg hunt after church. So uh, everyone, though, is welcome to stay. We're going to cook some hot dogs and have some chips and socialize. We can watch the kids run around and, and have a big time. So hope we have a beautiful day like today. Um, if you haven't brought any or can bring some um, uh, candy to go into Easter eggs, please do that. That's something also that has to get going on. And then, of course, the following week will be Easter, where there's a lot going on then, the sunrise service, as well as, of course, the church service. So um, all those things are right on top of them. Uh, you can look on the plan ahead. Uh, there's a Christian Ed meeting after church today. There is a work day tomorrow, and I know um, some people may question why do you have a work day? Uh, because most of the women that do the work out front are retired, <laughs> so that's why we're doing it on a Monday. But for those of you that aren't working, if you'd like to come help, we're just going to spruce up uh, the landscaping. Uh, we're going to start around 9 o'clock, men or women. Everybody's welcome to come. So, anything else anybody want to mention? So, uh, we're going to have a call to congregation meeting from April the 7th. Um, we have a few things I will try and have pictures in the bulletin next week. And we will, uh, I will have a packet put out here next week for everybody to see what the meeting is about. No, no two weeks in advance, so I will put some meeting on there. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Quilting on Tuesday. Quilting Tuesday. We want to keep it at 5 today. Oh, okay. 5 o'clock, instead of 3. All right. Have our hearts and minds for worship. Well, good morning. Back on the I know you're not going to watch this for this afternoon because of all that's going on in Dodge this morning, but good morning to you. Ah. I'm getting cute if I didn't turn my mic How's that? <laughs> Now we go. So good morning. Back home, good afternoon. We'll see you. Thanks for waving at me back there. It, uh, it helps. Hello to Arliss. Um, thinking about you, Bev, as you get ready for surgery this week. Uh, and praying for all that stuff that's going on back there. Um, Immediately following the service, if you volunteered to be a reader for Palm Sunday for next Sunday, if you can meet with me up here just very briefly, I want to hand out the, the scripts for that, and we'll sign parts so everybody knows what they're going to be doing. So it won't, it won't take very long at all. So, let's stand for the greeting and the passing of the peace. Grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us share the peace of Christ with each other.
mercy, renew us daily in the gift of baptism, and remind us of the promise we have through your Son's cross. Let us always look to the cross as the sure and certain sign of forgiveness of sins, hope and healing in this life, and the promise of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the proclamation of the word. from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, and you can find that on page 784 in the Pew Bible. Thus says the Lord, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The second reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, beginning at the first verse, and you can find that on page 1190 of the Bible in the pew. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just, was, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Here ends the readings. All right, can I see Jan? Mm -hmm.
some shamrocks. All right, let me get by. Y'all sit right there, please. Could you sit down there, please? please? I will. Oh, I guess, Laurel, you want to sit right here? Of course, you can sit by your bubble. Oh, of course. All right. Let me let's get down here. Okay. How are y'all this morning? Good. Looking sharp and you're green and your spring colors. Are you ready for the sun? Special uh, trophy, and how did it make you feel when you won a medal or a trophy? Happy. Yeah, happy. We, these were my son. This is uh, a golf tournament and, and um, some of this FFA stuff. So, yeah, did you keep your medals? Yeah, I did only my medals. And, and you know, when you have your trophy or your medal, and you get first place and you're up at the top, and you've got your second place and your third place on each side of you. You haven't experienced that yet. You will. You're still young. I promise you will. Well, you know what? That makes us feel pretty good, doesn't it? To be, I'd be honored. That, to have applause and say, yay, we did a good job. Well, Jesus was talking with James and John and a set of Zebedee. They were brothers. And they were also disciples of Jesus. Those of you that come on Wednesday night should know what a disciple is with the disciple. People who follow Jesus. Exactly. They were Jesus' father, you know, closest friends that traveled. So James and John, they were good friends. But, you know, even though they traveled with Jesus, they didn't have a really good understanding completely of what Jesus was here for. So James and John, these two brothers, the disciples, they say, you know, teacher, you do what? Could you do anything for us, please? Do you know that? And Jesus says, well, what do you want me to do? What would you like me to do for you? And they said, well, um, you know, in your kingdom, because they were thinking Jesus was going to do what? A king on earth, right? With a crown, like you would think of a king. In your kingdom, we would like to of what's going to happen on the cross, right? Exactly. So, Jesus answered and said, I'm going to specifically give you the verse in the Bible, that even I, the Son of Man, came here not to be served, but to serve others, and to give my life as a ransom for men. Jesus was right. to eventually 
Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. Taking the twelve, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, Look, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, and spit on him, and flog him, and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Now James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. He said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. In my sermon title, I ask a question. Can you pronounce it? Karen, you did a great job with it. I've heard it slaughtered many times. It's pronounced Melchizedek. Can you say it with me? Melchizedek. Congratulations, you've just said your first Mesopotamian word. Melchizedek is mentioned by the author of Hebrews nine times in three chapters. Anybody know who he was? <sighs> Outside of Hebrews. Yes, very good. He was the priest in the book of Genesis. That's very good. Hebrews seems to be utterly fascinated with his character, but he's only mentioned two times in the rest of all, all, all the scripture. Once in Genesis and the other in Psalms 110. So let's look at each of those references. First in Genesis 14. The background is that warfare erupts between nine kings. And when the fighting is over, Abraham's nephew, Lot, has been taken captive and marched away, probably into slavery. Abraham gathers, we are told, 318 fighting men and pursues them and totally routs the former victorious kings, emancipating Lot and recovering all the booty that the kings had carted off from their sacking of Sodom and Gomorrah. Upon Abraham's return to the hill country, which will one day be called Judah, a, quote, king of Salem, who was also, quote, the high priest of the Most High, God, comes out to greet and congratulate Abraham on his victory and blesses him with these words. He says, blessed be Abraham by God most high, creator and possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. So in response to that blessing, Abraham gives this man, Melchizedek, a tenth or a tithe of everything that he brought back from this battle. So that's reference number one. The individual, the priest and king who comes out to greet Abraham is none other than Melchizedek. Now there's a few things that help give color to the story. Salem is the ancient word for the city of Jerusalem. 
So Salem is the ancient city of Jerusalem, which will one day be the very heart center of the worship of Yahweh. The term God Most High translates the Hebrew El Shaddai. That was made famous by Amy Grant more years ago than I care to remember in one of her songs entitled El Shaddai. It's a name or a nickname frequently used to refer to Yahweh, God of the Most High. Now the Genesis text itself does not explicitly state that old Mel worshiped Yahweh or served as one of his priests, but Abraham sure acts as if that is the case. Giving a tithe to a priest is an act of worship. Psalm 110. This psalm is known as a royal psalm. That is, it refers to the king, or in Hebrew, the Messiah. Jesus uses the first verse of this psalm to refute the furious attempts by the Jerusalem authorities to trap him in word games. And it says in the Gospels that after this event, they quit trying to trap him with his own words. They, they quit trying to get him hung with his own words because he was better at the game than they were. But in using this psalm, Jesus is doing something else that his Jewish audience would have understood instantly. He is proclaiming that he is the long-awaited Messiah. That he's the one that they've been waiting hundreds of years for. No Jew would have missed that. And in the midst of all of this, verse 4 reads as follows. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And that is the verse and the application that the book of Hebrews specifically mentions three times and serves as the basis for that author's argument that Jesus is our great high priest, divinely appointed to that position by God. Now, there are some of us, when we read the Old Testament, who look at some of these kind of interesting stories and wonder, is this Jesus in some kind of pre-existent form? He turns up a couple of times in strange ways like this. We don't have an answer for that but it seems sort of interesting to wonder about it. Well, if you read this argument that the author or preacher of Hebrews makes, it's pretty repetitive. He comes over the same ground a number of times and we kind of roll our eyes at it. But this person had to convince a Jewish audience of this very specific point or his argument wasn't gonna go anywhere else. He had to convince them that Jesus was a legitimate high priest. The reason for that is to be a priest in Jewish circles, you had to be from the tribe of Levi. No exceptions. That order was laid down all the way back in the time of Aaron and Moses by God himself. If you were from any other tribe, you simply could never be seen as a legitimate priest, which means you had to be a Levite to be the high priest as well. So this is the minimum, requ minimum requirement. If you want to be the presiding bishop, if you wanted to be the grand poobah, if you wanted to be the muckety muck, you had to be from the tribe of Levi. Part of the reason that Judaism was so splintered in the time of Jesus was because Rome and those Jewish authorities who were in control totally ignored this. And they sold the office of high priest to the highest bidder. This made people furious. And a section of Jewish people were so mad that they actually withdrew from Jewish society. We know them as the Essenes, the, those who were the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what tribe is Jesus from? Judah. So he could never serve as a legitimate priest, let alone a legitimate high priest, unless the understanding of the office could be reframed and re-understood, which is where the, the high priesthood of Melchizedek comes into being, comes into play. 
Melchizedek was spiritually in a superior position to Abraham. The tithe that Abraham gives establishes that. His priesthood is hundreds of years older than the Levitical priesthood. And Mel was both priest and king, which is the same claim that the author of Hebrews is trying to make about Jesus. So this addresses the issue that Jesus didn't look like or wear the garb of the high priest. He couldn't. It did, but that didn't matter. This proclaimed that Jesus is not only our high priest, but he's our legitimate high priest. Well, what kind of high priest is he? This unfolds first in a generic way, and then later it gets more specific. But in verse 1, Jesus represents us in matters related to God. What he says about God, who God is and how God acts, we can take to the bank. Two, he offers gifts and sacrifices for our sin. Now we know about the sacrifice on the cross, but in Hebrews 7.25 it also says that the gifts are his non-stopped intercession on our behalf. He never stops praying for us. That's a pretty cool gift. If any of you have been on the receiving end of people's prayers, you know that's powerful, but the big guy's up there praying for us all the time. That's really powerful. Verse 2, he deals gently with us when we go astray. Because as one who has lived in the flesh, he understands how easy it is for us to go astray. This is called grace, and it's grace in action. You don't have to live up to a certain code all the time. And there's a way to move beyond that when we don't live up to it. Verse 7. His prayers are heard because of his reverent submission. I don't know what you understand that to mean, but it refers to Jesus' prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Greek here is pretty violent. It says that he begged God to save his life. But his submission was in the words that his prayers ended with, a prayer that never fails. You know what that prayer is? Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Never fails. So Jesus goes to the cross voluntarily while his body is screaming, No! No. Verse 8. He learned obedience by what he suffered. Jesus believed God, and so he obeyed God. Which, by the way, is the exact teaching that he comes back to over and over again. That's the lifestyle that Jesus calls us to. Even if that leads to suffering. That might be worth pondering. In verse 9, all of this made him perfect in every way. And made Jesus our perfect high priest. So, so what? What does all this mean for us? Well, glad you asked. Let me quote from Hebrews itself to answer that question. So first from Hebrews 10, verses 22 through 25. Therefore, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Whew. There's a lot of Old Testament Jewish thought in that sentence. Wash with pure water. Every time a Jew came into a place to worship God, he washed himself with water. They had what they called a mikvah. It was like a little bath. And the mikvah had to have a certain percentage of what was called living water, water that flowed. It couldn't be all just a cistern that was there. There had to be some way for water to move through the mikvah. So that's the washing with pure water. 
having our hearts sprinkled. <laughs> this is kind of gross, I'm sorry, but this is just, I'm just telling you what it, what it says in the Old Testament. Normally when they made a sacrifice of an animal, they slit its throat and they, they captured the blood of the animal in a bowl. And oftentimes that blood then was either sprinkled on the altar or taken into the Holy of Holies and placed before something that was there. But there are occasions where that blood was forcefully thrown on the altar for the purpose of that blood coming back and splattering all over the people. It might stain your Sunday go to meet and close, right? It's pretty disgusting, but that's what he's talking about. Our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us, which is exactly what that ceremony was all about. So let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us encourage one another. So because of what all Jesus has done for us, and this is pure response language, this is grace language, because of what Jesus has done for us, we support each other. We encourage each other. From Hebrews 12, the first two verses. Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Consider him who endured such opposition so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So this is a foot race metaphor. And if you're going to win that foot race, what do you have to focus on? What's the goal? What's the finish line? And he's saying here that the goal and the finish line is Jesus himself. You've got to keep your eyes fixed on that as you run with perseverance the race that God has called you to run. In verse 14 of chapter 12, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. I'll just pause for a moment to say holy is a word that means to be set aside for a specific purpose, set aside for the purposes of God. That's what it refers to. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So this is about unity. Not that everybody does everything the same way, but that the purpose is unified. We are children of God. We are followers of Jesus, and that's what we're called to be to the world. Finally, from selections of the 13th chapter of Hebrews, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, so let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Keep on loving each other. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, continually offering to God a sacrifice of praise. And do not forget to do good and share with others. Well, if you follow that, you were talking about a life that has been completely and totally transformed, living for others in the way that Christ lived for us serving as Jesus said he came to serve so that's what it means for us to have a great high priest like Jesus so receive the closing doxology from this very long sermon um, I think it would have taken a number of hours they might have even missed lunch over this sermon here's the here's the doxology may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Glorify thy name, and how majestic is your name. You got it? You got it. <laughs>
Yes, there is a transition between the two. So let's stand and sing. Continue our response to God's word using the confession that's typed in the bulletin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father of mercies and God of all consolations, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may attend to your word, confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Let us make our confession to God. Our help is in the name of the Lord.
Jesus instructed his followers that if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. Do you believe this? Yes, yes I believe this. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. Through his Holy Spirit, he cleanses us and gives us power to proclaim the mighty deeds of God, who called us out of darkness into the splendor of his light. In obedience to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Rejoice! The Lord has made you free. You may be seated. Judy, would you join me up here? You turn around and face them so they can see you. See your good side, right? So Judy has declared that she would like to become a member of this fellowship, and so this is a very brief ceremony to do to accomplish that. We welcome you as a member of Bible Lutheran Church to join with us in worshiping God, hearing his word, sharing his supper, proclaiming the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, serving all people, and striving for justice and peace in all the earth. So welcome. Would you please welcome Judy? So let us pray for all the people that Jesus may bless them and touch them and move in their lives in ways that they can't even imagine. Please stand as we pray. Lord God, I start off by giving you thanks for examples like St. Patrick. Kidnapped at an early age, separated from all that he knew. But after you came into his life, he felt the call to go back to those people who had kidnapped him and was successful in bringing the message of Jesus and his cross and his love for all humanity to the same people who had once kidnapped him and made his life a misery. So we thank you for the courage that you implanted in his heart, for his willingness to be obedient to your call, which probably seemed crazy to him at the time, and for the results that you brought about through his courage and his willingness to speak. May that serve as an example for all of us. Lord, in your mercy, we give you thanks for the ways in which you have worked in lives some of the amazing things and healings that you have done for Juliana and successful back surgery, for young Zane Dickey released to go home from the NICU yesterday, for Deb Lowe and her recovering at home from this very serious abdominal surgery, and we give you thanks that she is doing so well. And for my mom, who, uh, it's just amazing the condition and, and where she is versus where she was just a month ago. We thank you for Virginia DeSalvo for her successful cancer surgery and for her recovery and just continue to lift her up to you and just stand in amazement at all that you've done in these situations. Lord, in your mercy. So we lift up to you those who are still in need of your touch in some way that we probably don't know what to ask for. For my friend Ralph and his friend Fred and Ralph's wife Margaret and all that's going on there, uh, particularly that you would give Ralph continued health and strength. For Barry as he recovers from hip issues, for Bailey his struggle with cancer, for CL and his continued journey through health. For Jeff diagnosed with bladder cancer for Joanne, diagnosed with lymphoma, 
and for Dave finishing chemo with spots on his liver and just pray that you'd be with him in this journey and then if possible that you would bring healing. We pray for Pastor Ellie. We pray for Tim Burrell's mom as she continues to do well. We pray for Tammy. We lift up to you Ashley who had to go back to the hospital last night and hopefully that they've got things sorted out and she'll be able to go home today. We pray for Fran recovering from the brain tumor. And I'll lift up to you, my friend back in Dodge, Bev, as she uh, prepares for hip surgery later this week. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We pray for those who are struggling with loss, for the families of Liz and Molly and Jack and Audrey and Pat, uh, Rebecca Zipper's grandmother who died this week and was buried yesterday. I think we all carry grief from some loss that never quite goes away. And we offer that up to you. We do it in faith, longing for the day when we will be gathered together with all those who we've loved and when the tears will be tears of joy. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We lift up to you those who have long-term situations going on that will need a long time for recovery, for Lisa, for Jason. Um, we don't know what's going on, so we just ask that in this cone of silence that you would work to bring about one of your miracles. For my parents as they continue this journey, for Sharon, we give thanks that Stephen is fully recovered and doing well and with us this morning. For Rick, suffering with chronic kidney problems. For Paul, for Brenda, for Mary and Daniel, for Sarah and her long, painful journey, for Dorothy, for RMA, for Isabel, and for Sarah with her diagnosis of MS at a young age. These and other concerns that we hold in our heart, we lift before you, Lord, in your mercy. We lift up all those who are first responders in all different kinds of positions that you would keep them safe, that you would bless them, that you would allow them to use their skills to help others in times of need. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And we pray for our partners in ministry, for Danny and Rebecca, for John and Carol, for Jimmy, for Lisa, for Kristen, for Christy, for Amber, for Maritime Bethel, for Matt and Christina, and for Christ the King in Dodge City, Kansas. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Help us, O oh Lord, to rejoice in and give thanks for the beauty that surrounds us. Help us to learn to be good stewards of this home that you give us called Earth. Bless us that we might be a blessing to others. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we receive the offering, we sing verses 1, 5, and 6 of We Give Thee But Thine Own. to 
and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord. You bid your people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast. Renew our zeal in faith and life and bring us to the fullness of grace that belongs to the children of God. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. prayer that it begins on page 69 in the front of your hymnal, the left hand, left hand pink column. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all creation with light and life. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Through Abraham and Sarah, you promised to bless all nations. You rescued Israel, your chosen people. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise, and at this end of all the ages, you sent your Son, who in words and deeds proclaimed your kingdom and was obedient to your will, even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread of suffering, gave thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. When the supper was finished, he took the cup of salvation, gave thanks, and gave to them, saying, Take and drink. This is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Gracious Father, with this bread and cup, we remember the life our Lord offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of our Lord and of his resurrection, that we who receive the Lord's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place, and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. We pray together the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father.
Christ given for you. The body of 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 Christ given for you. you and fill you. May the Spirit come upon you and give you all wisdom and joy. May the hope of Jesus always be in your heart. May Christ love all of you. given for you. The body of Christ given for you.
understand? Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you to life everlasting. Amen. Our post-communion canticle is hymn number 339. shine warm upon your face and rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. A reminder that following the service, I just have a brief meeting with those who are going to be readers for next Sunday's service. Our closing song, Oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing.
Um, he wants to meet and talk with as many folks as he can. It's, uh, of course, he's married. He's probably middle 50s, I'm guessing. He has three children. Um, so it's, it's really been a breath of fresh air. He seems to be, you know, one of our good ones. So we'll, we'll have to see, of course, where God leads us and guides us. But um, I think it most likely will take part in the service also. He wants to come to church. He wants to do something in the service. And that will be again on like the 14th, I think, of April. So this is after Easter and all the stuff is over with. So just be kind of thinking and planning on that. There will be more to come. Uh, we've got several logistic points we've got to get worked out and um, anyhow I just wanted to share that with you that uh, God is good it's like Karen said uh, your prayers I don't think go unanswered uh, they're, they're just in God's own time so um, having said that um, y'all probably have seen this before heard about it before maybe maybe uh, 12 keys to an effective church you know, and it has like these 12 keys in here. Well, just I'm not going to go through each one of them, but as I went through them, we probably are hitting on uh, seven or eight solid keys out of 12. So that's a very good thing, you know. Uh, there's things like visibility, relationships, uh, financial um, stability, and there's several of them. But what I mainly wanted to share with you as part of our uh, ongoing um, prayer for our upcoming pastor is that um, you know too many churches do long range planning in a safe and comfortable zone and this book goes on to say uh, God does not call us to stay by the Red Sea he calls us to follow him into the wilderness into a mission that invites us to be the, our most creative constructive and compassionate selves um, the basic question is for many people in many congregations do you believe that your best years are behind you or do you believe your best years are in front of you? You know, the old half glass full, half glass empty. I'm a person who believes in half glass full. Our best years are yet to come. Uh, so it goes on to say, uh, um, some churches believe the best years are behind them. Some believe the best years have yet to come. Uh, they behave and act as though the future will be less than which has passed. Uh, as it's precisely because they behave and act that way that the future for them turns out to be less than which has been. Effective, successful churches live in the confidence of God's promise that some of their best years are yet to come. And in Revelation, we find chapter 21, verse 5, And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. This does not mean the future will become less progressively better and better. Rather, it means that Amidst the pain, suffering, and tragedies that lie before us in our future, God goes before us to make all things new. So our hope is that stronger than our hope is stronger than memory. Salvation is stronger than sin. Forgiveness is stronger than bitterness. Reconciliation is stronger than hatred. And resurrection is stronger than the crucifixion. So as we get uh, going into Easter and into all the stuff that you know takes place during Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, that sort of thing, just uh, know that God goes ahead of us. And just as we've been praying and it seems dim and bleak, uh, God is ahead of us and he's going to send us that right person. Um, I hope and pray that this is that right person and we shall see. But anyway, I just ask that you continue to pray for the call committee, the pastor 2D and their family and Pastor Corky, as he has graciously been serving us for an interim, which I cannot tell y'all how much of a relief that is for a church to have an interim that can kind of help you out and you don't have to really worry about keeping the church, I would say, running and for finding pastors and all that sort of stuff. So, anyway, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, Lord. We just ask you to continue to bless this congregation. Continue to instill in us your will and guide us and direct us in your wisdom that we make the choices you would have us make for the betterment and future of this church. Lord, just be with us as we go through the Easter season, remembering what you have done for us and giving up Jesus as a sacrifice for all of us. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
shown you what is good.